insurance company we're building together with Munich, for example, uh, the team is 10 people. And that's a full-fledged PNC insurance uh, company because they can rely on the rest of the team. So in the shared service team, we have uh, people that work, you know, today they work for a bank, you know, two days later they work for a, for a Carrefour or, or for, a, uh, so for retail, and the other day they work for, for banks. So they have this big uh, mixed background, and to attract the big talents, uh, they come to the to the specific projects. Uh, so the shared service team is a full-time employee uh, type of team in uh, in our um, hired in our company. And the people who come to, big, to run big projects, they are hired uh, for the senior positions, and they uh, they come from the outside for a specific project. Uh, and I thought at the very beginning it's going to be really hard to to pull that talent to to our business. <laughs> And it turned out to be uh, really easy. Uh, uh, we, uh, we just had a, car, uh, a board member of Carrefour joining us, uh, myself. Uh, I run uh, uh, one project uh, as well. And uh, the other people are coming because we have, um, we have offer, uh, an offer that uh, cannot be ba uh, uh, beaten by uh, big corporates. First of all, uh, uh, you run your own business. And uh, you don't have to be you know, a CEO type of a person to run it because you get all the support. You know, many of us uh, who work for big corporations, the biggest uh, fear of leaving it is, uh, you know, uh, I am a great, I don't know, uh, 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 data scientist, but I have not no knowledge about marketing or HR, so I'm not going to set up a company, it's going to fail. We say, come to us because we need that talent that you have and we'll give you the rest. So that's the first thing. Uh, a lot of people want to leave, but they just wait for that last push. So we give that push. Uh, and, and second of all, we give shares and... Uh, uh, you know, if uh, people become a co-owner of a company, that's a completely different type of, uh, uh, of motivation. And uh, I don't have to do anything for people to stay overnight and, you know, work really hard to deliver on a deadline because they motivate themselves. It's an internal motivation. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, is really winning. We felt it would give us the best access to the strongest possible group of senior insurance decision makers. InsureTech Insights is a must-do conference, I think, for the network that is built here. Uh, we have a very interesting panel. So uh, all perspectives are represented here. We have a startup, we have an insurer, we have two reinsurers, and I'll try and add a little bit of the investor perspective as well. So before we kick off, let me ask the panelists to introduce themselves, please. So Joanne, do you want to start? Yep. So I'm Joanne Safo, Global Program Director and Head of Tech for Digital Partners. Um, Digital Partners is a unit of Munich Re that was set up about three years ago, and we work with insurtechs and others who are disrupting the way that insurance is sold. They fundamentally really focus on the customer acquisition, customer journey, customer tech, and we support them with everything else, so product pricing, all the other boring insurance stuff that no one's interested in. Um, and we've been going for about three years now. Um, we work with startups in Europe and the US, and we're looking at other regions across the globe, so we've just started looking at Australia, Canada. Um, our mission really is just to change the way that insurance is done and to, to be the carrier that, you know, insurtechs can work with and operate the way they do. I'm Adrian Jones. I'm head of Score Ventures. Uh, I also run strategy and business development for Score uh, on the PNC side. Uh, I set it up in 2017. We've done a number of deals since then, both investments uh, as well as commercial partnerships and often uh, both at the same time. Uh, previously, I was in Bermuda and in consulting before that. Uh, my name is Maciek Marszałek, uh, apologies for an unpronounceable name. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of The Heart Ventures. Uh, it's a company that I founded uh, with my colleagues uh, last year uh, to, help start, uh, to help corporations, big corporations, uh, uh, build startups. Uh, before that, for, the, uh, for uh, slightly over 15 years, I've worked in the insurance and banking sectors uh, across the globe. Uh, right before I uh, uh, co-founded the Heart Ventures. I uh, had a digital and data transformation for AXA in, uh, uh, in uh, almost 30 markets across uh, certain Eastern Europe, uh, Africa, Middle East, and uh, Latin America. Hi, I'm Christopher Lohmann. I'm heading the property casualty part of the Gotha Group. Gotha is a mid-sized mutual insurance group located in Cologne in Germany. We are about number 10 in the German market, um, and we are very proud that we will turn 200 next, next year. Uh, I joined Gotha two years ago after serving 18 years uh, the Allianz Group, um, where I directly entered as the head of the property casualty part, and together with my colleagues, we try to do exactly what we talk about uh, this morning. We try to disrupt our company from within to ensure that Gotha will last at least another 200 years. 
Great, and I'm Shweta Akbarma, the second unpronounceable name on this panel. So I think that was the selection criteria. Um, I run a venture capital fund uh, called Leo Capital. We are active in Southeast Asia and India. Uh, we invest across sectors, but I lead our insure tech practice, uh, given my experience as uh, leading MetLife's open innovation practice for Asia for about three years. And before that, actually, I built an insurance company, which I sold in India in 2015. So I've been across sort of all the tables in this, in this gathering. Um, so let's kick off, I think, Joanne, let me, let me sort of kick off with you uh, and just say, um, should corporates even think like startups? Uh, is, this, is this sort of an overreaction going on? Um, in my opinion, I would say no. Um, the fundamental reason I would say that is because they're not startups. It's a bit like asking, should an elephant think like a mouse? They're, you know, they're two totally different, two totally different things. Um, I think what is really important, though, is that the um, corporates really have an understanding of the incumbent and the, the startup industry. Um, in order to, there's no point thinking like a startup if you don't have the people or the infrastructure or the mandate to act like a startup, and that's the most important thing. Um, so I think what they need to make sure they do is understand the incum incumbents, understand what the opportunities and the risks are that come with, you know, the incumbent startups. And I would say what they should either do or probably do both things is figure out how to make their existing business resilient to the in startups and then figure out how they're going to get involved and proactively be part of the insure tech movement. Okay, so you're a no. Mm -hmm. it, I think, Christopher, you said you're a yes, so I'll go straight to you. Well, What's my, the my counterpoint? Answer, my answer to this is, is a little bit twofold. Um, on the one side, I think that indeed we should think more like startups. And indeed, there is a lot that we can learn from startup thinking, like uh, focusing, focusing, focusing on the customer, uh, trying things, uh, failing fast, but then really failing, uh, putting things to an end. There is, there is a lot that we can learn as corporate from, from uh, the startups. And we, we did learn a lot over the, over the recent years. At the same time, there is a lot that we as corporates bring to the table. So I think we should not overdo it. There is uh, the great expertise we have in underwriting and in the core insurance functions. And by focusing of becoming more startup-ish, so to say, we sh really should not forget what our core strengths and our capabilities are. What I do think is very important, for us at least, is that we understand how startups think. Because for us, as a mid-sized company, we do not have deep pockets. We need to cooperate. We want to cooperate with startups. And if we do not understand how startups think, what they are looking for, what is interesting to them, we will never attract the startups we would like to cooperate with. So I, uh, I'm of the opinion that actually it's very difficult even to think like a startup when you're in a big company. And my company is only uh, 49 years old. Um, uh, so I guess I'm one of the youngest uh, incumbents here in that sense. Um, I find that the biggest challenge when you're forming these partnerships is actually less about thinking like the startup, but actually even just talking the same language. And I'm not talking about French versus English. Uh, I'm talking about the way that you express yourself and what you're trying to do and how you form plans and how you communicate deadlines and timelines that, of how you're going to work together. Uh, it just becomes uh, actually the, probably the biggest pain point in most of the partnerships uh, that I've had. And I do think that there's a lot that both sides can learn from that. Um, but in terms of who we are, you know, we are a big established company with 3,000 people working for us in a 42 billion euro balance sheet. We need to protect that. And if we decide that we're going to go out and break things and fail fast, uh, that's not something that our rating agencies and our customers actually really want us to do. So if we want to be customer focused, we have to focus on that long term and the longevity, which unfortunately means that change is a little bit more incremental than perhaps uh, sometimes we would like. Maciek, given your experience in AXA and now running your own startup, what's your take on this? Well, it's quite similar to all of you, actually. So uh, I think, you know, uh, God forbid, uh, no, don't think like startups if you're a corporation. Uh, each time it happens, it's always a disaster because, uh, uh, and it kind of, I think it's kind of like in, in, in waves. Uh, I've worked, you know, uh, almost, almost now almost 20 years in corporations and I've seen, you know, the trends. Sometimes it's, yes, we should think like startups, we should be agile, we should form agile uh, teams. Uh, we should work like Google, uh, and obviously it fails because uh, you cannot run a big corporation like a startup, and then it's like we should not think like startups. And today we are still, again, in this trend, you know, we should be Google again. Uh, it's, it's not in the DNA of a big corporation to, to act like a startup, so just don't do it. Uh, work with startups, uh, and if you open up uh, to work with startups, uh, then, uh, then the good things come out of it. And so I would say, you know, don't think like startup, work with startups. 
uh, majority of them uh, are created by people who come out of corporations. And uh, these people very, very rarely uh, create competitors. They, most of the time, they want to uh, work with corporations or be bought by corporations at some point. So learn to work with them, or learn to recognize talent, learn to recognize uh, good startups that bring additional incremental value to your business and, uh, and cooperate with them. And if you can do this, it's enough. So that's my point. Got it. So I think the, the key theme that came out there, it's attention, right? So you've got to work with them, but don't think like them. So that's, I think that, that segues nicely into sort of what, what is the best way to sort of access working with startups? What's the best innovation vehicle? So again, Christopher, do you want to sort of start off there and, and sort of tell us a little bit about how Gother is doing it? Is it an internal business unit, external? How are you sort of balancing the, the different needs of the internal incumbent versus the startup? Yeah. Well, in the end, again, I think that we need to go both ways, and at least that's the way at Gotha we, we try to do this. Um, the, the majority and the, the hard part of the transformation is, of course, course, making the company itself and the core processes more innovative. So really to disrupt the company to some extent from, from internal to, to come up with good innovation and good innovative ideas from within, that is a hard way. To change a company from within is really a very difficult and a hard way, and we just experienced that. Um, we introduced um, a couple of years ago a new SME product, totally new product, standardized, modular, um, new processes, a new IT system, new approach to sales, uh, open for, um, for different insurtechs and so on. That was very difficult because there was a lot of resistance within the company, specifically with our own sales force, who were used to great flexibility, individuality in our, our offering. All of that was gone and there was a great challenge to really overcome that. Now we are out in the market, the, the product is selling, it's, it's really an excellent um, success story, we are very happy. Um, and what is more important, then there were some 60 to 80 people that were working on that specific project. And they came really out of this with a great experience and now we transferred this team that developed the product and the processes in an agile way into a truly agile organization. And so that is, that is an example for, for really disrupting or changing the company from within. Um, and managing to some extent um, the resistance that, that you have um, in, in a company like like Gota. At the same time, of course, when we try new ideas, like I just was listening to the insurance on demand panel next doors, we do that with a startup in Berlin, we do some telematics. Uh, so we really try new business models, uh, then you need to go outside and you really try to need to find the, the right startups and the good ideas, cooperate with them, and then in the end try to bring the innovation back to the company. But that's that's, that's hard, and to really make a change and to really make, make a difference, I think it's important to do it from within. Interesting. So if I could sum up, you're saying, if it's an internal current business model problem, do it internally. But if you're trying to access a new business model, new approach to customers, try and do it externally. Well, we have at Gota, we have 5 billion of turnover. Yeah, we have 4 million customers. Um, by, by really setting up innovative ideas outside, I will never really transform our business model to be able to serve these customers tomorrow. So I need to really revise and we really need, need to innovate it from, from within. Uh, otherwise, I will lose that business. At the same time, of course, I need to try new ideas. And this is, <coughs> this is what we are trying to, in a balanced way, try to do. Again, the high wire balancing act. Joanne, I, I guess it will be helpful to have Munich Re's perspective. You set up a new unit completely separate from the mothership, so to speak. Yep. How's that worked out? And what was the reasoning sort of thinking behind <coughs> that? So Digital Partners, we are a unit of Unit Re, but we act quite autonomously from the group. Um, so we have our own processes, we have our own way of hiring, we have a totally different approach to the way that we interact with our partners. Um, and I actually think the best way to do it is kind of to be, to be distinct, but to be linked, because there are things that both sides can learn from each other, um, but both sides have a completely different use case. So Munich Re Group is a, you know, is a really massive, successful, the biggest reinsurer in the world. Don't tell me off. Um, and, you know, it, it's very successful in, in what it does. And so, you know, working with InsurTechs, yeah, it's cool, yeah, it's sexy, it's innovative, it's fun, but really it's not proven itself yet. So if we start, you know, we operate in a particular way which works for our startups because we work like them, we think like them, so we make it easy for them. If we try and 
transport that back to the group when actually their clients don't work that way or the people that they employ don't think that way, all it's going to do is break what they do. And so I think until our model is proven, it doesn't really make sense to kind of, you know, force that, uh, you know, back onto the group. Which And there are some elements of insurance that will, will probably never fall into digitalization or never be, you know, at the moment, yeah, it's very really easy to, to digitalize a customer journey for retail P&C. If you want to go and digitalize buying, you know, commercial insurance for an oil rig, you're not going to go onto an app and do the underwriting for it. It's just, it's just not ready for it yet. So I think it's really important to kind of keep it separate, make sure that the two parties are continuously um, in discussion. You know, for example, the things that make insurance really, you know, the key to insurance are you need a big balance sheet and you need to have the regulatory expertise. At a startup, it's really difficult to build a big balance sheet that you would need to, to underwrite insurance. So I think in the same way with the um, with the group, you know, they, they might struggle with acting in an agile way. There are things that you can continuously share and pass between each other, but I think what you should do is act in the case of what your use case needs to be. So can, can, I, can yeah. I build yeah. on that? Because yes, I think please. there's... Uh, this is where if you're an innovator in uh, a big company and you're trying to figure out how do I get my company to move and you look at Munich Re Digital Partners and you look at SCORE, we're actually set up in a very different way. Um, but that's because I think you, know, you found a solution that works for Munich. Yeah. Um, we are working on a solution that we think works for SCORE, which is actually the opposite, which is we are highly integrated in the business. Uh, I sit with an eyesight of our underwriters, our CEO, uh, other senior executives. Uh, I'm a part of that leadership team. Uh, and so we believe that, uh, so if you think of who those people are, those are all people who have come up out of the organization, out of the traditional part of the organization. And you need to get them to move in order to actually create something new and innovative. And so you have to show immediately value for that part of the organization. And so what we've taken the approach of basically, let's find the people in the organization that are interested in innovating, and let's work with them and uh, figure out something that works. And suddenly, they're starting to uh, see increased business coming to them, better profitability, better numbers, smoother processes, et cetera. Uh, and then they become your advocates within the business. And so that's how we've gone about uh, approaching this cultural change. Yeah, there's some parts of the organization, unfortunately, they're going to be more resistant. And, um, you know, it just takes some time. Uh, but we felt that in our culture and our context, if we were to set up a, an independent unit over across town in a nice office space with beer on tap and all this, I would really like that, actually. That'd be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that in my context, that wouldn't work. I see. So you're not a fan of beanbags. Um. Oh, I am a fan of beanbags. <laughs> oh, but score as a whole, it may not work. Understood. We haven't got any beanbags. <laughs> no beanbags? No. You can't have a different unit without any beanbags. That's, <laughs> that's like bare minimum. Majek, uh, you, you know, you've, you've got this whole completely external point of view, right? I mean, you're, you're helping insurers build startups from the ground up externally completely to the, to the main unit. So help us understand a little bit of how that model works and, and how it sort of ties into some of the other points that the panelists have made. Yes, yeah, so before I say this, uh, uh, when I worked for AXA, like the, the general insight that I have from the inside, AXA is a great company, it's huge, uh, it has huge budgets. When I was joining AXA uh, to, to lead the digital data transformation together with a few colleagues, uh, we were quite an elite group. We had uh, a, a really huge budget to spend on a digital transformation, and we had the same idea, the same approach. You know, uh, we'll, uh, We will uh, reinvent the core from the inside, and we will do some... Uh, and on, uh, some experimenting on the outside. And uh, when I was leaving AXA, I, uh, I realized that uh, it's really difficult to do this, uh, even if you have money with the internal uh, uh, barriers. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think uh, AXA also transformed itself uh, uh, since, I, since I left, uh, having the same, the same insight. So uh, I think you, we are all right uh, saying that uh, we should you know, uh, do both, uh, externally and internally. Uh, with a slight tweak, I think uh, disrupting the core is also important because if you don't do it uh, on the outside, uh, uh, it turns out that the core projects are really important uh, to, to deliver. Uh, they are run too slow uh, and they are dying in the process because the board gets uh, bored with the, uh, <laughs> with the timing that it takes and they refocus back on the, you know, the traditional model that brings money. And uh, the side effect of that is that you know, everything else that is being uh, uh, delivered on the outside in the experiment mode uh, becomes a hobby project that is not relevant for the business. And it dies in the, uh, in the process anyway. 
So uh, what's, uh, and, and that's why I founded this company. Let's say, you know, let's break this model and let's, uh, let's try to reinvent the core as well on the outside. Uh, and we actually work for both models. So uh, uh, I have a separate team that uh, we've built together with my uh, colleagues uh, um, that uh, is doing scouting from technologies. And at the very beginning, uh, and that's for reinventing the core. Uh, and and so the reason we, we uh, did this was that, you know, uh, big corporations, they came to us at the very beginning, were very trendy. Uh, at that time, uh, the only company that works in such model um, in the region. And they said, find me, uh, find me insure tech startups that are really cool, that can uh, help me understand you know, the, the, uh, how we can reinvent our own business. And what we did, uh, we actually said, no, uh, insure, insure tech companies are cool. Uh, we can find them, but uh, we, what we really do, we look for technologies that support, uh, uh, that, uh, support the core. So we're not looking for, I don't know, another... Uh, another uh, cool insurance company that you know is popping out in the market. We're looking for technologies that support uh, some specific uh, business um, uh, streams uh, uh, inside the business. And then to your question, uh, we also build companies from scratch for corporations, and we do it for the core. Uh, we really try to touch the core because that's where it's important, and that's where also uh, many of you who work for big corporations you have all have to reinvent yourselves once every while. Uh, so you don't become, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, the extinct uh, species in some uh, in some point. So you have to also uh, do this once every while. This exercise. So we set up separate companies. We actually set up uh, uh, insurance companies as well. Uh, we're uh, we're launching with Unicre, which is so big that we didn't even realize. You know, we didn't know each other. <laughs> Uh, but we're launching a, a, a completely new uh, ground-up uh, business for, or together with Unicre as well. Uh, and it's, in, it's remarkable if you do it from scratch with zero. You don't have any legacy technology. You don't have any uh, barriers. Uh, you will never have a conversation, you know, what will agents say or what will the agent network say. Uh, uh, when we start from scratch, we're able to build a full-fledged, you know, a PNC insurance company uh, within six months. Uh, we're launching it uh, this year. Is going to be 200 million pounds premium next year, hopefully 2020, for uh, for the Central Eastern Europe uh, region, um, and that's an exciting and really refreshing experience. I recommend to everyone uh, uh, to to do this, uh, and that's done for a established uh, traditional uh, business. And a lot of technologies that we are developing for this business will be migrated back uh, to the mother ship, uh, and that's uh, what I think is really key to do. Interesting. That's the sort of Opposite of lean startup, the big, the full, fully paid up, fully, uh, fully funded sort of approach from the ground up. I think to summarize here, you know, there's no right innovation vehicle. I think it depends on your specific culture and specific uh, context from whichever you're coming. I think the one thing that did come out clearly from all of the panelists, though, was a quick win is important. You need a quick win in your innovation unit to sort of anchor its legitimacy. And I think that's where Marcek mentioned that initially it was about finding startups that can plug into the core before launching a new one. So I think bring, sort of winning, getting that quick win on the board helps you sort of open the, the taps to, to sort of trying more exciting and, and, and sort of more out on the edge stuff. But let's, let's sort of move away from the vehicles and go to the, to the people inside those vehicles, right? And it's really important to get the hiring right. How do you make sure you, you are getting the right kind of people to be manning your innovation units, whatever they're doing. So Adrian, do you want to start there and sort of just talk a little bit about how you're getting the right people in, into the SCORE Ventures, the right processes, et cetera? Um, so we're, SCORE Ventures is a very small unit. We largely rely on the, uh, the rest of the business, actually. And so a lot of my job is to get people excited throughout the organization, uh, finance, legal, underwriting, actuarial, all the people that you need to put together a team uh, to make it work. Uh, and I've basically taken the approach of the army of the willing. Um, we find those people who are really interested in it, and they get involved in it, and then they tell other people, hey, I'm working on this cool new project. Here it is. Uh, you know, we'll bring the, the CEO of the portfolio company in to give a, a, a presentation, and they feel very proud about that. Um, so to me, it's, um, you know, it's, it's that, and it's making it appealing to people. Uh, it's letting people know this is the future of the business, some of the things that we're working on, and there are a lot of people that find that really exciting. So um, we, I found it easier and easier in the two years that we've been doing this to, uh, to start building those teams. Uh, and it is a little bit like the Shackleton expedition because you're telling people this is going to be a long, hard journey, and it's not clear that we're going to succeed at the end. Um, but uh, so far, we've made it every time. So. 
So you're hiring from within uh, the, the, the business unit and just uh, help sort of getting, is it double hatting or people are moving completely to your unit? So we have one person that works for our unit. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, he'll be here tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, I have a double hat myself. Everybody has a double hat. Uh, but we find that that's actually a strength because we can take, you know, it's people who are actually part of this organization. And so if you're partnering with us, you've got access to the best talent all around the world, all 3,000 of our people who can help to make your business a success. And we think that the, the incentive is highly aligned there because we want the company to be successful because we want to have some profitable reinsurance that comes out of it or some other sort of good commercial relationship. So that's why, again, the, the kind of the score solution, we found something that works for us. Interesting. Christopher, what about at Gother? And you talked a little bit about the resistance and yeah. getting sort of, what, would, what did you do to sort of change the mindsets, bring in sort of more agile culture? Um, before I answer that, perhaps let me, let me answer the, the first question with regard to the, to the hiring. Of course, I mean, for us at Gotha, a mid-sized company sitting in Cologne, it's not easy to find data scientists. They are a rare species, and of course, everybody wants to have that them and or AI experts and, and uh, or CX experts and um, why should they work for a mid-sized company uh, and basically what we find is that um, it is it is difficult but it's not not too difficult and the one thing is I talked a little bit about the the history of, of the company we are 200 years old we were founded by <coughs> entrepreneurs helping each other and this entrepreneurial DNA still sits within the company so we are um, a, a company um, acting for companies and Indeed, uh, people find that attractive. They really find that attractive, specifically those who really like, like or have a, some sense of entrepreneurial spirit themselves. The second thing is, uh, is size. Size can be, uh, in our case, can be really an advantage. We are not too big. We are mid-sized, so when we talk to corpor corporations or we also talk to talents, they really like the size because they really can make a difference. And people like to make a difference. So when we hire for setting up a, a cloud strategy and AI uh, business use, use cases or for, for building a new database or deep learning, these kind of things, people come, come on site and they can immediately uh, grab things and can immediately make a difference. And that is, that is of some importance for them as well. And the third thing is we started, yes, we started the, the transformation and the change of Gota two or three years ago. Um, and with all the, the corporations we do in the markets and which everything that is happening within the company, um, yes, uh, this is visible in the market and people and, and talent is attracted to that. So, so the size, the entrepreneurial spirit, making, getting, getting people into, into a responsibility uh, soon and fast, making them make a difference, that really helps uh, to attract the talents that in the end we need. It still is, is difficult, but it is doable even for a company like, like ourselves. Now, if we talk about um, the internal, internal way, this is, of course, I mean, this is very much hard work. This is a lot of um, change um, that needs to be done. I'm, I'm fully with uh, uh, my co-panelists here. You need to have some lighthouse projects in the end, and you really need to carry that forward. You need to be transparent when you make a mistake, and you need to allow for mistakes um, and um, to find a business culture and to develop a business culture that takes, takes care of that. But specifically, the lighthouse approach uh, the early successes, that's clearly very, um, uh, very good and uh, a clear advantage uh, on this route. China, do you want to add something on how different unit is? Are you hiring insurance people or non-insurance people? So again, I would say that we're pretty opposite in our approach to hiring. And that for us, we think it's really important to have people from not only outside of the company, but from outside of the industry. Um, and I think one of the important things for us is you really need to have people who think in a different way and actually introducing diversity at the point of recruitment is super important. And I don't just mean in terms of colour or gender, I mean in terms of their background and their experience. You know, it's, it's, it's quite common in most insurance companies to, you won't insure an underwriter unless they've got 10 years experience and they wear pink socks and walk around the square mile. What we're trying to do is, you know, bring in different types of talent in, into the to the business, you know, technology is so much more important, you know, when working with startups and working in disruption. And so, you know, if you're trying to attack, attract the, the best tech, tech technology a talent, um, when they come out of university, they don't want to go and work in an insurance company. They want to go and work at Google. The reason why is because most insurance companies have, you know, enterprise legacy technology. So what you need to do is you need to make an environment for them which is exciting. You need to be in a unit that can use different type of technology, the type of technology that kind of these guys want to use. 
And I think it's really, really important to have different types of skills, different types of thinking, and different type of people. Um, in terms of processes, again, I think it's you, what you find in a lot of uh, corporate businesses, regardless of whether it's insurance or not, is that there's processes for process sake. People will do this because they've always done that. I think the one thing that we try and do is we have processes that are developed by the team. Um, those processes change all the time. We have like, you know, everyone's, we work in a really autonomous fashion. People are responsible for their own decision making. Um, and so I think, you know, there's no hierarchy. People are empowered to make decisions. And so I think really changing the mindset and kind of the culture within the team is also super important. Interesting. And has it, has it had any pushback from the main enterprise, like having totally, totally different culture, totally different sort of skill sets in this, in this unit? No, I, f I feel like they've actually been really supportive. So I think that was one of the things when uh, digital partners were set up, that we made it very clear that if we're going to do it, we need to be able to do it in the way that we think <coughs> is, is the best way to do it. And actually, from board level all the way down, it's been uh, very supportive. Um, there are cases, of course, where, for example, if we're writing a brand new product, we have this masses of skills of expertise in underwriting, we'd be silly not to make use of that. But what we've done, for example, is if we're, if we're doing a new product, it might take usually four months to get it signed off. We've agreed kind of a special fast track process that takes 24 hours. So I think the, the mothership, as it were, is kind of mobilized to the bits and pieces that we do need to do with them. They do it in a different way that suits our business model. May I add to that? Yes, please. Because I think that's, that's a very important point that you're making. I, I also believe, we firmly believe, that you need to bring in not only people from outside of the industry, but also from outside the industry. I mean, the insurance industry for many years was very much product-driven, product-focused, and very much process-driven. Um, and, it it and still is. It still is. Yeah. It still is. Um, and still is. And we try to change that. And what we, what's what I mentioned in my opening statement, we try to, to change that. Uh, startups are very much um, customer-driven customer-driven, service-driven, and this is clearly something that is not within the DNA of the insurance industry. And if you really want to change that, you need to bring in people with a different experience. And from other industries, and we do exactly, we do exactly the same, that, exactly that. For instance, in, in the claims department, in our claims uh, staff, that, uh, that we bring in people from the consumer um, expertise or from, from startups who have a totally different experience in really building services around personas. This is not the thinking that we have. But this is the thinking that we need. And for that, we need to bring in fresh, fresh ideas and fresh minds. Interesting. Magic, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's actually the, the, uh, the, the cornerstone of, uh, of um, how we operate as a, as a startup building company. Uh, when I found at the heart from the very, very beginning, I didn't want this company to be a, a startup builder for insurance companies, even though in you know, my last 10 years was in, uh, working in insurance. It was supposed to build startups for big corporations operating in Europe. And uh, you know, it's a completely different approach if you want to build a new startup that you know, will be tackling a, a, a one product. Uh, so you build a product team, a business development team, I don't know, marketing, HR, and so on. It's a completely different beast if you want to build a company that will repeatedly be build startups and will essentially become a, a startup uh, uh, factory. So uh, the, the, the model is helping us uh, shape the team because, uh, first of all, we work for many clients. Uh, we are a global partner of MasterCard, so we, we are an externalized uh, uh, lab for, for MasterCard in Europe. So we work for banks, uh, so that's one side of the coin. We work for retail, it's the same other side of the coin of MasterCard. Uh, so uh, the way we structured ourselves is twofold. Uh, we have what we call a shared service. So I'm not gonna focus on this a lot, it's not so important, but. Uh, there we have people that do HR and marketing and you know, finance, that we have our own IT and so on. Uh, and they are supporting the, the project teams. Uh, so we can build uh, what we call two pizza teams. It's, uh, we stole it from Amazon. So basically we can feed you know, the whole team with two pizzas in the evening. Uh, so, so to develop a company, so the insurance company we're building together with Munich, for example, uh, the team is 10 people. And that's a full-fledged PNC insurance uh, company because they can rely on the rest of the Team. So in the shared service team, we have uh, people that work, you know, today they work for a bank, you know, two days later they work for, a, for a Carrefour or, or for, a, uh, so for retail, and the other day they work for, for banks. So they have this big uh, mixed background, and to attract the big talents, uh, they come to the, to the specific projects. Uh, so the shared service team is a full-time employee uh, type of team in, uh, in our, um, hired in our company, and the people who come to, big, to run big projects, they are hired uh, for the senior positions, and they, uh, they come from the outside for a specific project. 
Uh, and I thought at the very beginning it's going to be really hard to, to pull that talent to, to our business. And it turned out to be uh, really easy. Uh, uh, we, uh, we just had a, car, uh, a board member of Carrefour joining us, uh, myself. Uh, I run uh, uh, one project uh, as well. And uh, the other people are coming because we have, um, we have offer, uh, an offer that uh, cannot be ba uh, uh, beaten by uh, big corporates. First of all, uh, uh, you run your own business and uh, you don't have to be you know, a CEO type of a person to run it because you get all the support. You know, many of us uh, who work for big corporations, the biggest uh, fear of leaving it is, uh, you know, I am a great, I don't know, uh, 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 data scientist, but I have not, no knowledge about marketing or HR, so I'm not going to set up a company, it's going to fail. We say, come to us because we need that talent that you have and we'll give you the rest. So that's the first thing. Uh, a lot of people want to leave, but they just wait for that last push. So we give that push. Uh, and, and second of all, we give shares. And uh, uh, you know, if uh, people become a co-owner of a company, that's a completely different type of, uh, uh, of motivation. And uh, I don't have to do anything for people to stay overnight and you know, work really hard to deliver on a deadline, because they motivate themselves. It's an internal motivation. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, is really winning. Yeah, the incentives part I completely get. I think a lot of people start up startups to become insanely rich. So it's great that you're doing shares. I think hard for, for large companies to offer shares, uh, and you're doing a partnership route, so that's different, I guess. But internal units, I guess, will have to sort of figure out how to create different types of incentives. You have a, the high is not that high, but the low is also not that low. Um, so on that point, I guess, of, of discipline of startups, uh, just curious about how do you deal with failure? For a startup, it's very easy, right? If you run out of money, it's over. But for corporates, right, the, 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 there are a lot of zombie projects that keep getting funded, and you find another 100K here, another 200K there. Mm -hmm. How are you instilling discipline to, to the other part of startups, right? I mean, startups die and die with an enormous amount of frequency. Are your innovative projects also dying, and, and, and are you tracking that? Does anyone want to go? Adrian, you want to go there? Um, Fortunately, no, because we have a very rigorous process that we use. Uh, you know, SCORE has been upgraded 19 times since 2003, and it's largely because we have an extremely rigorous planning process. We publish three-year plans. People know what we're doing. That discipline translates internally as well. So zombie projects can't just hang around because there is an intense competition for internal resources. And what we've done from the venture's perspective in order to keep these things from becoming zombies uh, I think similar to what, um, um, what Joanne was talking about at Munich, we've created a rapid escalation process and a rapid decision-making process. Uh, zombie projects exist because they kind of get out into the organization and nobody really has accountability or control for them. Um, but through our Ventures Investment Committee, uh, we have control over everything and anything. Uh, and it's led by the CEO. Um, his direct reports are there. So, uh, so we can make decisions very rapidly that way. That said, uh, one of the biggest challenges in putting together uh, big, complex partnerships, and I imagine uh, hopefully my panelists would agree, is that it just takes time. So it's typically more than a year from the first conversation to the final document being signed to actually uh, make the partnership work. Uh, and so you have to make sure that things are moving through the pipeline. Um, but so far, we haven't had any major failures, uh, knock on wood. Interesting accountability. Do you, um do you want to add something to that? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, we are still struggling with that. I mean, this is clearly one of the, the, the issues um, of handling these processes which, are, which we are really struggling with. So we, are, we do not have probably the discipline or we did not have it in the past that you are reporting. And we do not also have the pace um, of really letting um, uh, zombie projects die. Still, there is um, a lot that we have achieved over the last years basically by doing two things. One thing is... Um, we have a good experience with developing products and processes in an, agile, in, an, in, an, in an agile way. So last year we decided why don't we run our IT portfolio also in an agile way. Basically by saying that even large projects are granted budget only for the next increment only. And, and then after that increment is over and if that was passed successfully they, they can then apply for additional budget for the next increment, and there they need, really need to get into competition with new projects and with other large projects. And that, in the end, really led to more discipline in delivery of, of certain projects. We still have waterfall projects, yes, we do, but still in the need for really yeah, standing or stand, making your stance within that competition for budget, that really makes a difference, and we moved 
uh, we significantly removed the speed of implementing certain projects from, from months to, to weeks. So this is now really, really doable. We still do not have the rigor that you have out there when you really need to um, yeah, get new, fresh money, but still um, this is a way of, of doing that and we've had good experience with that. And the other one is, of course, that we set aside a certain budget for doing some speedboat projects. So the one thing is to really speed up the processes themselves. The other is to set up a specific process besides all the big corporate processes uh, for the release. I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to have one last yes or no question, starting from here. Uh, will corporates beat startup at their own game? You know no one ever sticks to the yes or no, so I'm going to say <laughs> it, it depends on the corporate. Uh, uh, get, get off the fence. <laughs> Most oh, of well, the then I'd say, say no. <laughs> I think most of the time the incumbents will win unless the incumbents leave the door open to the startup. Ooh, 1-1. One, one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say it's the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not the fierce competition. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an organism that works together. So uh, I think they would just work together at the end of the day. Draw, okay. <laughs> um, I certainly think that the corporates uh, can win this game um, if we have the agility and if we adapt and we are, I think, in good shape, then in the end we have a good chance of making that. Fascinating. So the corporates win 2-1 on the panel. Uh, of course, uh, I, I get the privilege of sort of wrapping this up. Uh, I wouldn't be a venture capitalist if I didn't believe startups could win. So the reality is, of course, I do think that, uh, that corporates leave enough space that new, new sort of new ventures can always be created and capture a lot of value. But I think this was a really interesting uh, sort of conversation from purely sort of thinking about startups and thinking about how startups apply to large corporations, I th I'd like to leave you sort of two, I think, two messages that, that, that we, we sort of debated here. One is, of course, the entrepreneurial side, which is about finding the idea, finding the innovation, doing the customer validation, discovery, and building the new sort of model. But equally important is the discipline of financing that and discipline of sort of making sure that you are... Uh, you know, keeping, keeping your projects on track and you're building a portfolio of projects that can actually deliver wins. The reality is very hard to predict if any one project will succeed, but as soon as you build a project portfolio, which is again what VCs do, your chances of success go up. So maybe this is the wrong question. Maybe next time it should be, should companies think like VCs? But I'll stop blowing my own horn. Thank you so much. And I think we'll wrap up today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.